I mean, it is my foundational framework, I think, for both therapy and seeing the world at this point. It's just such a mm-hmm. compassionate, cohesive way of understanding human nature. And then from the dynamics of like our little internal families and systems, then how we get to extrapolate that to our other relationships and other systems in the world. And if we get to start with what brings us well-being, what helps create this compassionate, strong, caring environment inside and meets our needs in such a loving way, can that be our focal point and our foundation point for what society should look like? Yeah. Instead of this top down, these are the right things. And can you fit in these boxes and in these structures? Can we start with meeting human needs? Right. Right. All of our human needs. (laughs) Right. 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 Hi, I'm Biz Cush, a life coach and therapist and your host here on the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. We're talking to women all over the world who found their way back to themselves, to their inner knowing, to their intuition, to their wisest self. We're exploring how to feel alive, authentic, engaged, and fully present in your life. Let's awaken your wise woman. Hi there, and welcome back to the podcast. This is the Awaken Your Wise Woman, and I am your host, Biz Cush. And I love this podcast. I love being here. I love talking to my guests. I love sometimes doing solo episodes, although that can be more of a challenge for me to come up with all that info and talk myself through the whole thing. But I do love those too. And I'm super excited about my guest this week. But before we jump into that, I want to encourage you to sign up for my newsletter. Because being a subscriber, you get firsthand knowledge about coaching offers. I've offered free sessions coaching groups, a very affordable way to do coaching with me is within a group. I'm running one right now, which is fabulous. I'll talk about that in a minute. And you get firsthand knowledge of the episodes. They will come right to your inbox. Unfortunately, my website program doesn't allow for the audio tracks to come with the episodes, but you'll have the outline. You'll have the show notes of the episodes so you can then jump in on your favorite podcast player and listen and enjoy. So you can sign up for my newsletter at elizabethcushcoaching.com forward slash sign up. And sign up is all one word. Elizabeth Cush is my name. Also, all one word with coaching attached. And uh, yeah, you can get all the info from the newsletter. I also take questions from the subscribers to answer in my newsletter or on the podcast. So if you had a question for me, if there's a topic you would like explored in more depth, whether it's on the podcast, I love to write too. So it could be in my blog post maybe. There's a little button for a survey that you can fill out and ask me a question and I'll answer it. Another bonus of being a subscriber of the newsletter. So today my guest is Catherine Quiring and we had a really beautiful, beautiful conversation around healing both personally and societally, which is becoming more and more important to me to talk about and to learn about and to get insight from others. So she shared this amazing, she calls it her Catherine inquiring list that she was gracious enough to email me, like how we move from a dominating culture from domination to interdependence and collaboration, from high control and centralized control to listen to yourself and others and get some consent. She goes through a whole list of what we can, we are moving from and what we're moving toward as we rebuild, reemerge as a society, as a culture, as the world. One of my favorite parts of her list that she developed based on books and authors 
Elizabeth Lesser, Alnor Lod- Ladha, and Lynn Murphy. My favorite of the list was going from humans being on top, so human supremacy, to humans as part of the ecosystem. Because the ecosystem depends on us to be a part of it for it to thrive and survive. And we tend to treat it like we own it when we don't. So just a little tidbit from our conversation. There is so much more. Let me tell you a little bit more about Catherine Quiring. Catherine Quiring is a licensed mental health counselor and self-trust coach. She helps ex-evangelicals learn to trust their desires and reconnect to their inner wisdom. She also helps people pleasers learn to trust themselves and recenter themselves at the helm of their lives. She loves this life-changing work of therapy and healing and feels so privileged that she gets to spend her days doing this. Catherine is a cisgendered, able-bodied, white, thin female in a heteronormative relationship. She is a reformed people pleaser and ex-evangelical. She just discovered her ADHD neurodivergence and is an advocate for anti-oppressive spirituality. Outside of work, she's an avid podcast listener, yay, book lover, yay, paddleboard enthusiast, and toddler chaser. Some of our conversation goes pretty deep into the healing of our societal and cultural and patriarchal wounds. And I just think it's really a beautiful exploration of how we heal the world she and I talk about IFS and, and our own personal journeys with that and healing. And that's also just a lovely part of the conversation. So I hope that you take something away from this. And obviously you can find all of Catherine's connections and ways to connect with her and her books and her resources in the show notes. But let's jump into our conversation with Catherine Queering. Hi, Catherine. Welcome to the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. Hi, Fizz. It's so great to be here. It's so nice to have you. Do you mind sharing a little bit about yourself and what inspired you to do the work that you do? Absolutely. So I guess I'll start with when I went to college, I fell in love with sociology and just understanding how the world worked and piecing together all of the the factors that lead to social change and how people are involved and what makes everything tick. And that was my first introduction to that. And then I went into social work and I was like, I'm making lots of appointments for people and all of this stuff, working with foster families and foster kids. And I loved it. And then I was like, I want to help people on a deeper level. I don't want to just be like sending them to other people. So that's what Mm -hmm. propelled me into psychology, becoming a therapist. And then Mm -hmm. progressively, as I've done that, I keep honing in on like what feels the most important to me and the most salient. And Mm -hmm. it's been this journey of assertiveness and boundaries and coming home to your body and embodiment and trusting Mm. yourself and working with survivors of sexual abuse and narcissistic abuse and emotionally immature parents and like all sorts of childhood trauma and all of that. And then kind of weaving all of that in at the same time, I moved back to my hometown and was Mm. confronted with some of things that I didn't realize were still triggering to me from my religious upbringing. And the specific thing that brought that most to the forefront was just listening to Christian radio there's a bunch of Christian radio stations and the the songs and the Christianese just like took me right back. And I was like, I have to um, figure out what's going on here. <laughs> yes. And as I was exploring that, I was like, oh, all these things I've been passionate about, they are all related to my experiences in my religious environment growing up and how that impacted me. 
I am also an empath. And so I know that I am extra sensitive to emotions around me and I'm very aware of my internal world and what's happening there. And so I know that's another layer of that. And we can talk about that. I know a lot of listeners are highly sensitive people. And for me, that looks like empath, right? Yeah. Like um, there's yeah. some sensory stuff, some energy things. I'm also ADHD. And I'm just in the last week have been conceptualizing and wondering if empath is a piece of what we now call neurodivergence or mm. autism spectrum, because it's the sensitivity to emotions, like other right. people are sensitive to other sensory things, and a little bit maybe more black and white or aware of emotions and what I would have just called introversion before. So anyway, I'm kind of in the exploratory phases of that. And I'd love any input you have or listeners have on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I think I just had a conversation on another podcast where they were interviewing me and I was talking about high sensitivity and mm -hmm. the woman was like, it sounds a lot like neurodivergence. Yep. And, you know, and I was like, yeah, I guess you're right. You know, yeah. I mean, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting uh, yeah. connections. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. it's yeah. been interesting in doing this work. My feelings and the feelings of people that I work with in therapy or in coaching, when we do the internal work, it can feel really intense, the impact that some of these external things have had. Right. Mm. But then people that are still in those environments or maybe are less tuned into their internal world or emotional state are often like, that seems like not a big deal to me. Like, why are you calling that? Why is that a big deal? Yeah, <laughs> right? Why are yes. you calling that trauma or like, that's a problem or like, yeah. why is that not just an event that happened in your life? <laughs> totally. So, totally. yeah, that's something we can piece out if you want. But I think that's an interesting dichotomy or yeah. leads to cognitive dissonance and, you know, all this questioning of self and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and if you grow up in a family or or your circle of people are less sensitive, less empathic, less attuned to whatever mm -hmm. is going on outside, but inside too, mm -hmm. you, well, I know for me, it, it left me always wondering like, well, why, why me? Why am I the one that's feeling so deeply mm -hmm. about these things or getting wounded so easily? Yeah. And yeah. kind of leave you feeling like, it must be me. There must be something right. wrong with me or different right. about me that, yeah, yeah I, right. I don't fit in. Yeah, And I think that's, that's why I'm so passionate about people being able to come home to themselves and trust themselves. And from there, like having that safety and renewal and confidence and self-advocacy and self-sovereignty and trust, like, I mean, a lot of those are turning into buzzwords, right? But this sense of like, I am my own person. Yeah. I have an internal locus of control, as therapists would say. I have mm -hmm. my own agency. I can trust my critical thinking. I can listen to and trust my emotions and my body cues and be in sync and have this like beautiful, harmonious environment inside. And that to me is just so wonderful. And I love helping people be able to get there. And it's mm. been such, so amazing for me to be able to work through that in my own therapy. Internal family systems has been the modality that's been the most helpful to me in so huge. bringing those like that lovely of relational and compassionate yes. environment. Karen, lovely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. It, it really is. I was working with my therapist this morning mm -hmm. and yes, yeah, she's very well trained in the IFS internal family systems modality and and just the work we've done I don't know maybe we've been working together not quite a year but just that I feel so much more settled and as mm -hmm. you said at home in myself yeah. and able to take care of myself when I'm not feeling if I am feeling activated or parts of me are showing up instead of myself right like if right. I'm feeling right. like yeah which is just amazing it's yeah. just blows my mind sometimes. I know. I know. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 So do you bring that work into the work you do with clients, IFS and parts work? Oh, all the time. Yeah. I mean, it is my 
foundational framework, I think, for both therapy and seeing the world at this point. It's just such a mm-hmm. compassionate, cohesive way of understanding human nature. And then from the dynamics of like our little internal families and systems, then how we get to extrapolate that to our other relationships and other systems in the world. And if we get to start with what brings us well-being, what helps create this compassionate, strong, caring environment inside and meets our needs in such a loving way, can that be our focal point and our foundation point for what society should look like? Yeah. Right? Instead oh, of this yeah. top down, these are the right things. And can you fit in these boxes and in these structures? Can we start with meeting human needs? Right. right. All of our human needs. <laughs> right. 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 Well, and I think th- that's the thing that, I mean, well, I feel like in the IFS world too, it's like, can heal the world if everybody would just do their own parts work. Yeah. But the systems are so, I feel like in many ways, the systems are so entrenched and so a part of, especially Mm -hmm. here in the U.S., but, you know, sort of Western world, but I I, I guess across the globe too, that it's hard to sort of tease apart what is the system, what is our culture, how Mm -hmm. are these things impacting all of us, leading us? Well, and I think what frustrates me is that so much of our world right now is everyone else is the other, right? I, uh-huh. I'm i good, right? right? I'm good right. if I'm, right. you know, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, then kind of screw everybody else because right. what I'm doing is fine. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think IFS brings a different added layer or lens to that, right? That I think we think, If everyone just gets to say, well, I'm going to do what feels good to me from an unhealed place that doesn't work out very well, right? Right, right. If we do it from a place of understanding that any reactions we have inside are to protect ourselves or help ourselves in some way, and that may bring harm to, or like hurt to others that we can repair and be aware of, Yeah, that is such a more, much more helpful place to be in. And a few of my, I don't know that like the whole system where I will be dismantled, right? But I think my my hope and my focus, one is as I'm helping people individually, can you recognize where the messages that you have internally that are burdening you are coming from? And if they are from some of these societal pressures and expectations that are not there to help you, you don't need to hold on to them, right? You don't need to keep expecting yourself to be perfect or on time or have everything done just the right way or whatever those things are, you can give yourself permission to release yourself the burden Mm, of them and having to meet that. So I think that's where that ties in kind of on a personal level. And then that leads to like just little ripples of revolution, right? As you're like just living in your body and living in your freedom. And Mm. from that place, you're not taking advantage of other people, right? You're not like willy nilly, like just, well, I don't care what you think. Right. But you're living from your own sense of I'm empowered to advocate for myself, right? And be aware of what's good for me and the limitations around that. And what can I do about that? Right. And I think smaller communities in some ways are hope for starting to broaden that out. Mm -hmm. I am really entranced by all of first people's cultures and like indigenous cultures and how they had such a more collaborative society that supported well-being. And I don't know if that's possible on a national scale. Like I, this is one of my questions that I'm wrestling with, mm-hmm. but that to me seems like at least if we could start forming some of these communities, small communities, yeah. Right. Yeah. Modeled on that. And some of the, the things for even climate change and food sustenance are having small food communities like that too, right? Right, And that these people that we know, and even if we disagree with them, we can care about them and we can have conversations and negotiate a lot easier, I think, than on a larger scale. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's like one little thing. I really love Rabbi Dania Ruttenberg just came out with her new book on repentance and repair. And that to me Mm -hmm. seems like another hopeful thing. I'm only like 
partly through the introduction, but this idea of having a way of having accountability and making amends, which is something that is really missing in our society, right? So we've seen that in other societies who've gone through really painful things and that's helped them be able to move through it. Sure. And if there is some way to call for that and make that happen in larger and larger ways and settings, I think that feels really hopeful to me in addressing the harm and yeah. finding a way forward that those are some like little pieces that I <laughs> yeah, yeah, looking at moving forward. Yeah, sort of keeping the spark of hopefulness alive mm-hmm. and that there is there can be change there can be repair mm-hmm. there can be doing things differently for you personally coming home to yourself finding that sense of safety and ease within you how has that sort of shaped you in your work but also in your family dynamic in your in your your own family system as a therapist, it's giving me so much more ease and freedom where I just mm. get to come be present and be curious. And there's mm. just like all the pressure is taken off of me. I don't have to have the answers. I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to be the expert. Yeah. And I get to help other people be able to tap into that inside, right? So like I can be that supportive, regulating, guiding presence to help them get to that caring, compassionate relationship with themselves. Mm -hmm. And then they get to continue that work, right? And I get to help support holding space for that and being present to that. Mm -hmm. And like, I still need that from a therapist too. Yeah, There are some things that you need that support and presence from another non-judgmental, like really present person to get to. Yes. But I don't have to be the expert. And I feel like sessions are so much more of a like almost like meditative experience often because Mm. people are really able to like tune in with and take care of their parts and it is just such a lovely like renewal and rejuvenating and like reawakening and it just it just I'm getting chills right now like talking about it it's just so life-giving to me to be able to be a part of that and witness that Mm -hmm. with other people so I feel less strained I feel more supported. I feel like the work is definitely more effective Mm -hmm. and bringing really deep healing and lasting change. Yeah. For me personally, I feel like I, in general, am very rarely anxious anymore where I used to be just a ball of anxiety. Me too. I am more aware of what's happening for me internally as opposed to like people pleasing or being codependent or that kind of thing. I feel like I have a lot more autonomy and a lot more awareness of and trust in myself. So then Mm -hmm. there's a lot more just ease and listening to myself and strength and empowerment and that and sense of things feel at peace inside. There's just such a like wonderful community in there now and a lush forest. Like, I mean, it's just Mm -hmm. amazing, like internally. And now I think, it feels easier in my like parenting. I have young kids to know how to like flush that out and teach them about consent and be like validating their emotions and helping them work Mm. through them and teaching them emotional intelligence and that kind of thing. That feels great. Navigating like all the changes that I've gone through and how I'm showing up in the world some of my closest friends, even if they're not in the same place, they're like, wow, we see how how much you've grown and we just love it and we just Mm. celebrate you. I think my very close family relationships are still a little bit like, we don't know what's happening here. (laughs) Give us a chance (laughs) to catch up. (laughs) (laughs) But it's because they don't work that way. They're not therapists. They don't live in their internal worlds the same way. And so that's not as enjoyable for them to sit and process that. So... (laughs) Sure, (laughs) sure. Well, and, and, and I feel like in some ways, families are like, our own systems Mm -hmm. but you're supposed to stay in this whatever this mold this Mm -hmm. role right and here you are shifting and changing and like what do we where where are we supposed to go with that right right yeah yeah Yeah. so I think the biggest challenge for me kind of ongoing one is still learning like how do I be considerate and how do I be take someone else's feelings into account and work through compromise or problem solve but not appease, not go into, oh, you're Mm -hmm. feeling bad. Let me fix that. Or let me take 
I need to adjust or I need to accommodate because of that. And like, mm-hmm. I to figure out what's, how much is okay to just let somebody else feel, even if it's about me yes. and what is like my responsibility to help ease that or talk about that more or work through that. That's something that I still feel mm-hmm. like I'm navigating and it's getting easier, but that that's tricky. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. learning that new sense of what's the difference. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and I totally can relate to that because, well, especially in relationships that are shifting or changing where Mm -hmm. maybe people are feeling uncomfortable with the change that's happening in you, or Mm -hmm. even what I'm noticing too, is that some of the friendships that I thought were very healthy turned out to be Mm -hmm. not so healthy for me, Mm -hmm. you know, boundary wise, expectation wise. And so... I'm changing within that. And there's been some falling away of friendships that I thought were more that would have held on. Mm -hmm. And that's always hard. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. 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 So I know part of what intrigued me to why I wanted to talk to you when you reached out was the work that you're doing around sort of religious trauma and healing Mm -hmm. from sort of more cultural right. burdens that we're carrying. Right. And I feel like that's such an important conversation too, even though this is lovely. I love right. talking yeah. personal as right. well. <laughs> Let's go for but, it. Love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, how do we move beyond these systems to heal individually and collectively? Like, how do we find our sense of self if the world we know we're recognizing maybe isn't that healthy for us or our communities that we know, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, one of the things I've done was just kind of make a list of what we're moving from and what we're moving to, right? Can we understand what some of those cultural values and worldviews and things that are baked into our ways of knowing and being in this world Mm -hmm. and then start even just shifting those values or can we find different space there? So I'll like list a few of those. And I got these from Elizabeth Lesser who wrote a really good book called Cassandra Speaks. Mm -hmm. I think I read a different book by her, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, she's excellent. And Cassandra Speaks is about what if women wrote the stories, right? So what if we went back and said, what would life Uh, look like? What would our historical and understanding of ourselves and our society look like if women wrote the stories instead of men that that. were reading and telling the stories of the experiences that they had? I'm going to go buy that book after we It's so great. It's great. (laughs) And then Elnor Lada and Lynn Murphy, I've listened to some things that they've talked about Mm -hmm. and said, and I love the work they're doing around trying to create new communities and ways of being. So Eleanor Lada has the organization, we have like multiple ones, but one is called Tierra Valiente, uh, Brave Earth and in Costa Rica. And that's kind of where they're like building, trying to build a community that has these values Mm. and then have think tank for how do we solve some of these problems in the world that people are coming to us with. So that's someone that that I'm following them and just listening to what they're creating as well. And they listening to them is part of what helped me make this list. Mm. So we are moving from domination to interdependence and collaboration. Mm. So we're moving from high control or centralized control to consent based to listen to yourself and others or well and well being based, right? We're moving Mm. from respect and honor for the centralized authority figure. So that could be God, scripture, pastor, teacher, CEO, president, business leader, whoever that is, right? Yep. To respect for all. And this like mm-hmm. mutuality in our sense of ourselves, right? Yeah. And the respect for other people. Yeah. Um, we're moving from humans on top, which a uh, friend just called human supremacy lately. And I was like, that's it. That's so great. <laughs> right. Wow, like wow. humans are there to the interpretation of Genesis is humans were given the right to dominate and rule over the animals and over the earth. Right. And they're supposed to be good stewards, but they're mm-hmm. not kin to them. They are separate from them. They are things to use. Right. So right. that whole like transactional kind of mentality that we were given around that. Right. 
mm-hmm. instead moving to the kinship model that indigenous peoples have always had, right? Of like humans as part of the ecosystem. Right, right. right? That, that we, we truly are a part of. And yeah, yeah. Right. We're moving from extraction to respectful use, like as a mm-hmm. part of, right? A part of that system. Mm-hmm. So even the example of um, just food sustainability of indigenous peoples would let the first salmon go from the, the catch. And the salmon would come upstream from the catch, right? So that they would still have salmon for the next season, right? There was never mm-hmm. this just, we're going to take all we can get for profit, mm-hmm. right? So, yeah. I mean, just those kind of things, right? Or even in the Bible, there's this seven-year jubilee and there's on the seventh year, let the land lie fallow to rest, right? There are things that are not yeah. part of our current capitalist culture that right. have been built into other cultures and other times to yeah. provide that kind of care and part of an ecosystem, right? Yeah, yeah. We're moving from an unhealthy attachment to God to a healthy attachment to self. Mm. And from there, you can have healthy connection with the divine, whatever form that is for you. But it is right. not this patriarchal, hierarchical. All knowing, all powerful. All knowing, right, exactly. Yeah. And that you have to yeah. be like, codependently attached to God to be safe. <laughs> Can't have any other right. thoughts or any other beliefs. Oh, God. <laughs> um, can't be <laughs> with it. yourself. All of that stuff. We can get into that if you want. Yeah. Moving wow. from perfection to embracing our humanity in a growth mindset. Mm. And moving from judgment to like along the way, I call this a spectrum to like evaluation without judgment mm. to mm. compassion, presence, support, radical self-acceptance. Wow beautiful right like even the language around like can i live in my body can i support my body instead of can i manage my body or get it to do what i want it to do right right i was thinking when you were talking about extraction right we're extracting like as much fitness out of our bodies as like so much of us or or yeah like controlling the food that we eat so exactly. to to keep our bodies in this right. shape or form or whatever right. versus yeah. just listening and right. right yeah a word that's been really speaking to me lately is nourish right yes. this idea of sustenance and support and care and love around that right mm. and we can nourish ourselves with discipline with exercise and with food Right. Yes. And with rest. Yes. And what are all the ways all that we do it. that? Yeah. 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 That is a great word. Nourish. Well, it just feels so, <laughs> so nourishing when you say it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious. I love your list. I would love for you to send me your list because that okay. feels like such a beautiful I think sometimes it's hard for me to look at the systems in place and think, how are we ever going to get from right. where we are right. Right. to where I would like to see us be right. as a as mm-hmm. a country, as a community, right. as a people? Right. Just the words you were using, it, it doesn't feel like we can't do it this way. We right. have to change. It's like right. there's a process here right. that can happen between... Yeah here and here. It doesn't right. have to be these polar extremes. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you've mentioned authors and thinkers who are, have shaped your work and your, your thoughts and your processes and who you are. I'm curious what else has supported you on your healing journey to this place, to where you are today. Oh gosh. I mean, so much. I don't know where to start. I can like rattle off so many other authors. I was also in a a really lovely business coaching group that was really Mm. supportive. And the the coach Megan Meganson still has just like a weekly writing group. It's Mm. just such a, like, it's just, such a lovely supportive place to be present with yourself and express yourself and be heard and validated and supported. So that's just like a little thing that's happening for me right now. Beautiful. I've also found a few like friends locally that we 
meet and just talk about and support each other and whatever we need to that looks like a different version of support and spirituality and just really being present with each other that that's been really really supportive mm-hmm. I went through an anti therapist program with Dina Omar and that was really transformative and that was actually one of the points where even though it had nothing to do with religious trauma it's more about like our history as therapist and what we've been taught and how we can work better it taught she they talked through these systems so well and really that was kind of my the last like domino falling of any like hierarchy kind of stuff and i can't even have a hierarchical god in my i cannot do that anymore (laughs) yeah so it it really affected my religious deconstruction i think as well Mm. because of all the forms of oppression that have been part of it. And I think there's other ways of understanding and reading and theology, you know, liberation theology and whatnot. And there's a lot more stuff. Richard Rohr puts out a lot of stuff that's um, really good about other ways of yeah. interpreting yeah. scripture. But mm. yeah, for me, it's just been like, that can't be my authority. I need to be listening to people that are speaking about reclaiming these type of values and this type of compassionate care for yourself. Yeah. Right. So yeah, like mm. bell hooks, love bell hooks and yeah. Audre Lorde. And like, I've just been trying to read as much by black authors as well as possible and feminist and ecofeminist and as mm-hmm. much intersectional wisdom as I can. I just, feel like my mouth is wide open like I'm just like give me all the all the stuff that I didn't have like that nobody taught me <laughs> yeah well and it's true though it's like the traditional school or Sunday school or right. you know whatever mm-hmm. it is we're right. not hearing all the voices and all the harm right that's happened through this sort of hierarchical structure that we've created here especially in the U.S. but yeah just so much oppression that's been happening. And to me, it's a little terrifying that the whole library system, school Mm -hmm. education and in some states is now being questioned as to like, we can't talk about these things because it might make us, some of the students feel uncomfortable. I'm like, but that's part of the work is to feel, to figure out where it is touching you and And, making you feel uncomfortable. And it sounds like because there's no there hasn't been this larger way of processing the harm, right? That's not just each individual has to carry that and carry the shame of being a part of an oppressive race or system, right? Yeah. That there isn't a way to help carry them through that. Mm -hmm. Nobody's providing Mm -hmm. that. Right. And that's what we need, right? To happen. But yeah, instead it's like, well, just don't make anybody feel bad. We're going to still like whitewash these heroes mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. that started our country and right. our faith and whatever, right? That are very, yeah. we're going to make them one dimensional heroes and yes. just say, this is the right way to be. And you better be that way. Like even my daughter's in kindergarten now. And one of her like lessons was this little snapshot about George Washington, how he, I don't remember what it was about, like precision or something that he did well that like they're supposed to emulate and then he can be like George Washington and I'm like we I mean, know they're kindergartners you're not gonna give them a really nuanced view but like still right. <laughs> like, <laughs> just about like like a little bible story about like yeah I was gonna yeah. be a bible story about Paul who's you know this great missionary and it's just very one-sided right and you're not ever allowed to think past mm-hmm. that or question or a phrase I use a lot is separating intent from impact Mm. Right. And in our society, and Daniel Ruttenberg talks about this like already in the introduction so well that we have prioritized intent so much that if somebody intends good, we are supposed to forgive them and just move on. Right. Right. Appease, like this whole national appease, right? To for unity's sake. And and anytime you are angry or upset or say, no, that's not okay. I'm not okay with that. Then you get the other white supremacy things of like, well, I'm the calm one. So you're the problem, right? Like you better be quiet and calm and submissive and obedient. That's how we do life here, (laughs) right? Like there's just so many of these little values baked in, right? That if you don't follow those, you get dismissed and marginalized and shamed and 
Yeah. Yeah. Right? You're too extreme. You're too exactly. emotional. You're right. too worked up, whatever. Right. right. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, and I just think about, as you were saying, like our field of therapy mm-hmm. and coaching. In fact, I just signed up for a email list for someone who is working on the decolonization of the mm-hmm. coaching field, right? Like uh-huh, right. let's bring mm-hmm. in a more collective outlook, but also mm-hmm. let's look at the ways what we've done before has harmed others. Right. Exactly. You know, the diagnoses right. and the right. absolutely you know, the labeling and the Yeah. And just even like let's let's solve this with medication. Right. So again, it's this expert status. We are yes. here to explain yourself to you and right. tame you and control you and give you explanations for yourself instead of we're here to help you discover. Yeah. You now like you yeah. can think about the yeah. differences too and even like schooling that's like I'm going to teach you the right things and the the things you need to learn from rote memory versus like a Montessori or conscious parenting kind of right like more exploratory kind of thing right that's also this kind of dynamic right that's That's true and what if we can bring them together and be like okay what if we can use our collective things that we've learned and Mm. we can siphon out things that have created harm or doesn't work anymore and we can take accountability for that and acknowledge that and then we can keep anything that's been helpful and build on that. Right. And keep yeah, yeah, examining the theories and keep like working through. Right. And then if people mm-hmm. are coming in and saying, well, maybe that works for you, but that doesn't work for us. Right. Then we need to listen to that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's so key in all of this, right. Is really yeah. truly listening. Right. With compassion. Right. right. We're going to yeah, yeah. hear what you yeah. have to say so that we don't do harm. Right. One of the, examples of that that I I keep coming back to was on the documentary on Netflix Pray Away. It was about Mm -hmm. conversion therapy. Oh gosh. And it's a little bit hard to watch because there is not enough of a reckoning of harm done by even though a lot of the people who were faces of that movement don't agree with it anymore and they've embraced their queerness. There wasn't at least in the the video, there wasn't this like public apology. So that part's hard. But the part that really stuck out to me is that they were also part of the system that they were trying Mm. to emulate, right? And trying to, this is the right thing. I'm going to be the good Christian, good girl, boy, right way. Yeah. And then there was a point at which someone in Exodus Ministries, which was one of the big organizations for conversion therapy, had someone call and say, like, can we just, will you listen to us about the stories of the harm we've experienced as a result Mm. of this? And they said, yes, we will. And they came and listened with an open mind and they were so blown away and said, we had no idea. And then they disbanded it. They completely disbanded the organization, right? That I'm just getting chills. Like that's what we need to happen. Right. Yes. 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 Not right. take this defensive stand that, you right. know, you're wrong and I don't want to hear what you have to say or right. whatever. Right. That's what, can we listen to the impact, right? Even if our intent was good, which happens so much. I'm oh sure I've gosh. done that so many times as a white woman, having no, so many things that I did not know about yep. that I was doing. Oh, right. Oh. right? Yeah. And yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Like I, I can hold compassion and space for that, but we also need to acknowledge the harm. And that's actually really healing for both sides if we allow it. I had no concept growing up that there was anything like conflict resolution or repair. Mm. No concept whatsoever. Like it was just, you better fix it, right? The language around you and God is if you feel anxious, if you feel like God's right next, not next to you, if somebody is telling you that you're sinning and there's a problem, you have to figure out how to make it better. Wow. And that's what you get from authoritarian parenting too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You have Go to, to figure out how to make it better. Figure yeah, it out. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Time there out. No, until you no, stop crying. Yeah. Sense that I had of safety enough to even test that out or try it. Yeah. 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 Hmm. 
Well, I feel like you and I could probably talk for another 45 minutes or however long it's been, but I recognize it's probably time to bring this to a close. But if there were some piece of wisdom that you thought was important to share with the listeners, what might that be? You can love yourself and take care of yourself and you have permission to do that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and too, like I, not to, that's beautiful. And that just Mm -hmm. touched my heart, but, and I think that that can happen at any time in your life. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a constant kind of renewal of that with each different parts of us that come up or different seasons or different places, but Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so, so much for coming on the podcast. And I would love for listeners to know how to find you. Yeah. The best way is through my website, cqcounseling.com and everything I have is on there. So there's lots of great things to read, free quizzes and downloads and courses and I have a new book. And so. Mm, Awesome. And what's your new book? It's called I Am Poems for Expansion and Renewal. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Well, I will include all the links to your stuff and your website and social media and stuff in the show notes. But uh, it's been so great to have you here, Catherine. It's really been a joy and I've enjoyed our conversation so much. Thank you, Bess. It's been a pleasure. We covered a lot of ground in our conversation, Catherine and I, and I just love that it just feels like she is such a student of healing, a student of wanting to be a better citizen of the world and all of her books. I'm going to check out all the things that she referenced in particular that uh, Elizabeth Lesser book because that is right up my alley. And if you follow my newsletter, you will know that I share monthly, maybe twice a month, the books that I'm reading. And uh, I'm sure this one's going to be on that list soon. And as I mentioned in the intro, you also get in the newsletter exclusive deals and firsthand knowledge of openings of new groups or coaching times with me, therapy, you get all the inside scoop. So you can sign up at elizabethcushcoaching.com, find out what I'm reading, find out what I'm listening to, find out if you want to work with me. And hey, my new group that's ongoing, the Sensitive, Strong, and Unstoppable for a group for women who feel it all is amazing. I cannot tell you how honored I am and privileged to be a part of this group of women who are showing up in each group with their hearts. And it's lovely. It's amazing. So if you're considering being a part of the group, Next round, sign up for the newsletter. That's how you're going to find out when they're happening. Boy, I'm not sure that I could pick out a piece of that conversation that was my favorite part or that really crystallized what we talked about. But I guess in general, like overall, to me that if we're healing ourselves, if we're listening to ourselves and our parts with compassion and kindness and care and healing those internal wounds so that our systems are settled and at ease within us, it just makes it so much easier to approach the world from that space, to hear others, to fully listen and to work towards societal change, cultural change, making the world, as as she shared, that we can be partners in this universe with 
the plants, the animals, the planets, the stars, the atmosphere versus trying to control it or rule it. Pretty amazing stuff. Well, if you're interested in knowing more about Catherine, you can find all of her information and social media and the links there in the show notes at awakenyourwisewoman.com. I hope you all have a fabulous week and I look forward to connecting with you next time here on the podcast. Thanks for listening to the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Music by Andy Cush, sound editing by Laura Disler, and show notes by Kathy Cush. If you'd like more information about me, Biz Cush, and the resources shared today, go to awakenyourwisewoman.com.